Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Michelle Stover Wright, and on behalf of the Build Initiative, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar um, titled Young Children's Healthy Development and Learning in a Diverse Society An Overview of What We Know and What We Need to Do. Um, this webinar is based on a paper developed for the Build Initiative that compiled current research and evidence from over 30 researchers and advocates in the field on designing culturally and linguistically relevant, responsive, and competent early childhood education systems. Um, that full paper was sent to you when you registered for today's event. Um, I would just like to take a few moments to introduce our presenters, um, provide an overview of our presentation today, and just share some logistical information before we get started. Um, first with our presenters, Charlie Bruner is the Executive Director, Director of the Child and Family Policy Center and the National Director of Research and Evaluation for the Build, in, Build Initiative. He's written extensively around diversity and early childhood system building efforts. Charlie will be leading us off by offering some background on this work and some key highlights from the paper. Um, Eva Marie Shivers, who's the Director of the Institute for Child Development Research and Social Change in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, she has presented widely on her research looking at race, culture, and child development. Eva will provide um, insights into putting this knowledge into practice. Uh, we are really pleased to have over 140 registrants from 37 states on this webinar. It really offers a chance for wide input and questions. Um, this webinar and the documents are intended to be interactive. There will be opportunities for you to share what is happening um, in your state during this webinar, during some periodic um, opportunities for polling questions. We will be asked to respond. Um, and in the future, there will be opportunities to share resources and ideas to add to this document and to um, add as much input as we can from across the country. Um, to avoid distractions, you have been put on mute for this call. Um, we do want to hear questions from you, so um, there's a, there is a chat box on the left side of your screen. Please, during the presentation, feel free to type in your questions, and there will be opportunities for our presenters to respond throughout the webinar. Um, after the webinar um, tomorrow morning, you will receive a link that will include a recording of this webinar, um, the full paper, the PowerPoint, as well as a link to a survey monkey where you can suggest additional resources or input for this work as we move ahead. Um, now that these preliminaries are out of the way, I'd like to welcome Charlie Bruner to start us off. Uh, thank you very much, Michelle, and thanks everyone for uh, signing on to this webinar. And um, we're going to be a tag team, uh, Eva and I, and I'm going to do kind of the easy background work around what we know right now, and Eva's really going to speak about how we can then put that into into practice and uh, move forward uh, with this work. Um, and I hope that this orientation that I'm providing and that Eva's providing also can be used by people if they want to present similar information uh, in their own communities. And we'll certainly make the PowerPoint available for others in the field. Uh, the first thing that and the reason for the group of people getting together to produce this document that I'm going to describe was, was really because we recognize that it's important that we do intentionally address children's healthy development and learning in the context of their race, language, culture, and ethnicity. And why it's important, the first reason it's important, and I think one picture is worth a thousand words, is you see this little girl, um, and she's um, learning about a clock or a wheel and using her large and small motor skills, and, uh, and there are blocks around her that are um, uh, the ABCs and, uh, and painting and expression, and there's also uh, a white boy over in the back looking at her. And really, um, she is acquiring her sense of self in the context of the world as she grows and develops. And um, it's very important for her to learn her sounds and letters, personal care and hygiene, large and small motor skills, how to follow instructions, how to play with peers, in general what are encompassed in the five domains of school readiness. But she's also learning how I am different, how those different treat me, how my family is valued, when I should take pride, and when I should be ashamed. And a lot of these are, she's learning how um, 
the larger society that she gets into, and particularly the dominant culture, uh, is responding to her if she is somehow different from that dominant culture. So she's learning across the five domains of school readiness, but she's also learning in that context about how I fit in in terms of my race, language, culture, uh, and gender. Um, the document that, that we put together as a collective document, and we call it a living document because we want to add to it and, and expand upon it as it's reflected, really has three takeaway measure, messages. And I'm going to talk about the first two and uh, summarize those, and then Eva's going to talk around the last one. The first is that ensuring healthy young child development in a diverse and egalitarian society does require an explicit attention to race, language, custom, and culture. And we can't simply say we're going to be colorblind or culture blind as we go forward. We, if we really want to uh, support healthy young child development in a diverse and egalitarian culture, uh, we have to we have to do that. Um, second is ensuring quality within early childhood settings requires attention to cultural and linguistic responsiveness across all elements in quality rating and improvement systems. And the second part of the the document that you were presented with really looks at culture and linguistic responsiveness across the elements in a quality rating and improvement system. And I'll discuss what are the different elements of that uh, when I get to point two. And then third, early childhood systems builders need to learn from each other in putting this knowledge into practice. And that's where Eve is going to come in. So one of the reasons that uh, it's important to um, look at uh, the issues of race, language, and culture in our early childhood systems building is because of that uh, that young girl on that first slide, and she is coming to a uh, recognition of how she fits into society. Uh, but obviously, it's also important just in terms of the basic demographics of our society. I often say that um, uh, America is becoming more diverse and children are leading the way, and this slide really does show that. Well, um, people in my age bracket, and I'm 65, 65 and older, uh, our population is 80% white, non-Hispanic. If you look at those zero to five in our future moving forward, uh, almost half and soon to be more than half are uh, either um, Hispanic or of color. Um, right now, as of 2010, 51% were white, non-Hispanic. So that's a huge difference in terms of our population. And kids are really leading the way for our diversity. And the, the last two bars say, as we do so, we also have to recognize that who is serving those and who those people are who are having direct contact with young children and children uh, right now are not as likely to be as diverse. Our elementary, middle school teachers are almost as white, non-Hispanic as our seniors. And our health practitioners um, similarly and are, are largely less diverse than the population they'll be serving. So I think that the second reason it's important is it is the future of our society and diversity can be a, can and should be a strength in an increasingly uh, 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 world economy, but only if we provide the, the supports uh, to enable all kids to grow and develop and, and respond and, uh, and become um, uh, skilled and uh, contributors to our, um, to our economy and to life. Um, fortunately, we don't have to start from scratch in terms of um, addressing issues of race, language, culture within our early childhood systems. And that's what this document tries to bring forth as it draws upon the best available research and evidence in the field. And we did so by combining the wisdom and perspectives of 26 thought leaders in the field who we pulled together uh, for a meeting and then they followed up with us in fashioning this document and really fashioned the document to serve as a reference and resource compendium on what we know 
and what we need to do. And as I said, it's designed as a living document to be added to and adapted. And as you can see on this next slide, um, the 26 folks there are the people who contributed to this document by reviewing it, by, by making editorial changes, by adding in uh, references and resources, and I think really uh, put together uh, a compilation of information that can serve as a basis for anyone who wants to start out and say, how do we ensure that our early childhood systems building and our development of quality rating improvement systems and standards um, do reflect uh, and well respond to issues of race, language, and culture. Um, the first part of the document speaks generally to healthy child development and diversity in an egalitarian society and what we know, and then the second section goes on to, to look more explicitly at what can be incorporated into quality rating and improvement systems. And that first part um, makes five um, key points or findings. First, as, as we know, children learn, grow, and develop in the context of their family language and culture. Um, that they um, derive their understanding of the world through what uh, they experience first and most importantly at home. Uh, second, that there are universal aspects of healthy young child development, but there are also differences across cultures which we need to recognize and understand, and I'm going to go into a little more detail on, on that. Third is the children begin to establish their civic identity and um, in the earliest years, and particularly as they confront larger society, and if that society is different in terms of its culture and language than their home culture and language, uh, they learn how to navigate uh, those two worlds, and uh, we can't wait for a fifth grade civics class to, to begin to respond to children and uh, their understanding of the color of their skin, the language in their home, and the different customs and cultures that they practice at home uh, as they go out into larger society. Uh, fourth, children's growth and development is adversely impacted by personal, institutional, and structural discrimination and exclusion. And we know that across cultures uh, that, that children experience harm if they are not included in activities and if they do not feel that they are, they are valued. And finally, that this all requires early childhood educators need to be equipped to be able to respond to diverse cultures and languages in order to support inclusion and um, prevent marginalization and discrimination. Um, on that first point, the universality and difference in healthy child development, I think that the first, the five domains of school readiness increasingly are re recognized as universal across cultures. And Lynn Kagan has done work now in a number of different countries in terms of establishing uh, uh, indicators of school readiness, and they've pretty universally adopted those five domains, although they've sometimes added something else specific to their own uh, culture and language. But those five domains are really recognized as universal, and uh, we don't want to play in too much to the cultural differences in terms of what is healthy child development. But we also know that cultural differences do exist which require recognition and appreciation. Um, uh, and particularly our dominant culture society in the United States places a great emphasis upon individual identity, while many other cultures place a much stronger emphasis on collective identity, on the individual in the context of the family, tribe, or community. Uh, that there are differences in terms of the emphasis upon competition and individualization versus collaboration. There are differences in terms of materialism versus spirituality, in terms of having really a context-rich environment for conveying meaning versus uh, use of uh, verbal communications. There are differences in terms of the role of parents, elders, and extended families as, um, as um, uh, authorities in the 
uh, in the um, family itself that um, the children experience. There are differences in orientations to time. And there are differences in terms of gender, class, caste, and uh, differentiations uh, across individuals. And uh, there are differences in how civic responsibility is defined. And um, so we do know that those differences exist, and most of these differences are ones that we recognize as being, uh, I think, uh, differences that we should embrace and help children uh, value their home culture as well as understand how to be uh, living within uh, uh, the, the larger society or culture. But there are, in fact, um, some that uh, in our society and I think in a larger worldview, we don't tolerate uh, gender discrimination. We don't tolerate class or caste uh, sharp differentiations and that those are things that kids begin to learn and acquire at a very young age. Um, we also do know from a variety of literatures that uh, when kids are discriminated against or experience marginalization or um, are just not involved and engaged and included in activities, that contributes to toxic stress that really does constitute an adverse childhood experience and therefore produces uh, consequences or negative outcomes in terms of physical, educational, social, and behavioral results. Um, that it's also unhealthy for the per perpetrator as well as the victim when discrimination is uh, practiced. But it is part of some cultures. Uh, but as I said, both national and international expectations are for inclusion and tolerance and equity of opportunity. So the first part of this paper really speaks to the issues around there are differences by race, language, and culture in how children develop and grow, but we have to be committed in our early childhood systems to uh, combating the impacts of discrimination and marginalization and to understanding where those differences are and how we can, uh, how we can value and support them at the same time as we recognize that families and their kids want to be successful in uh, larger society and life while still preserving and uh, maintaining their, their home cultures and values. Uh, the final piece is that appreciating diversity and countering bias in discrimination early childhood settings does require that workforce diversity itself helps increase that recognition and appreciation. Um, and so there, there can be moves to broaden the diversity of the workforce could be very positive in this respect. But early childhood workers, in it, whatever their background and experience, can help to counter bias and help children with their civic identity and interactions. But it does take skills beyond what they are likely to have been trained and educated to provide. Um, um, so the opening part of our um, uh, um, document really speaks to kind of the general nature of what is culture and language and, uh, and what are uh, the different diver what is the diversity that we have to be able to, to promote and how then um, can we begin to do so within our early childhood system? So um, this is a time for that kind of the first question uh, that we wanted to pose to you uh, in terms of where is your state right now in the process of addressing issues of race, language, and culture in your early childhood systems building. And if you want to answer that you're just here to listen and learn and you wanted to get information, uh, that's fine. If you want to say we've recognized the need and we're just really deciding how to start, we've started to engage new voices, we're really deep into the work, or we're concerned that it may be too politically charged to address, we're going to ask you for your uh, responses to um, to this question, and uh, then shortly we're going to uh, give um, 
give a recording of where people are. I think there you can see. Uh, we're going to give a little time for everybody to respond. Hello, and thanks, Charlie. And while people are responding, I just want to remind folks that if you have a question for the presenters, um, please um, type them into the chat box at the left side of your screen, and, and we'll offer an opportunity to, for the presenters to respond to some questions from you. And we'll give just a few seconds more to let people get in their responses, and then we'll close it up and you can see the results. All right, I'm going to close it up now. Great. Well, I think from this polling, it really shows that um, uh, as we're in the beginning stages in many respects of building an early childhood system and beginning to develop quality systems, we're also uh, at the beginning stages of um, really looking and tackling issues around race, class, and culture. And I, so I hope that this, um, this document um, can grow and really be a living document and develop over time by our experiences in the work. Uh, at the same time that um, we have recognized the need and uh, we are starting to engage new voices in this work and I'm glad that most people don't feel that this is uh, simply too politically charged uh, in order to address, although uh, as we know, that this is not something that is easy for us in society uh, often to address in our public systems. Um, I'd like to now go on to the second portion of the document, which really went into more detail around quality rating and improvement systems. And most states are developing quality rating and improvement systems in order to strengthen the uh, uh, quality uh, and uh, developmentally appropriateness of their early childhood systems. And this framework uh, is really what is entailed in trying to improve quality. It improves developing quality standards for programs and practitioners, support of practitioners in continuous quality improvement, uh, planning, monitoring, and accountability around achieving those standards and meeting those goals, financial support for programs, practitioners, and families to, um, to be able to really provide for quality services and engagement, outreach, and promotion uh, to consumers, programs, practitioners, and funders. So uh, we've defined quality rating and improvement systems uh, as including a specific rating system used to measure uh, individual programs uh, as far as their quality, but also a whole range of activities that go into supporting programs in, uh, in securing higher ratings and, and, and developing their, um, their, um, their ability. And so we look at each of these five areas for uh, what we know about quality standards as it relates to uh, issues of uh, diversity uh, and cultural and linguistic um, responsiveness. And the first point is in terms of quality standards for program practitioners is that cultural and linguistic responsiveness and competence is a core aspect of quality. It's not the only aspect of quality, but it is an aspect of quality. And um, there can be programs that have very strong cultural and linguistic responsiveness and competence, which may not have other uh, aspects of quality, such as uh, uh, the type of education and training of the workforce, but they still represent uh, quality across that particular dimension. Uh, that secondly, the early learning standards are in the beginning stages of reflecting that responsiveness and competence in their definitions, measures, and guidance, and that they can be drivers 
for improvement, but it is really facilitated if they intentionally and explicitly incorporate definitions, measures, and guidance related to culture and language within their standards. So in terms of early learning standards and uh, the standards related to quality rating and improvement systems being explicit about uh, and intentional about incorporating definitions and measures related to cultural and linguistic competence are important to move forward. In terms of support for continuous improvement, uh, the training and professional development of the workforce is essential. And I think we know that that's essential independent of issues of race, language, and culture, but it's uh, particularly important in terms of strengthening uh, the workforce in ways that match the race, language, and culture of children being served and developing training and professional development opportunities that ensures that we gain uh, a diversity of providers who can match the race, language, and culture of children being served is important. Uh, at the same time, that training and professional development must equip all workers to become more culturally competent. And I think one of the things we've seen is advances over the last five years, uh, although there currently are limited tools and exemplary programs and evidence-based strategies for promoting this uh, cultural competence in the workforce, uh, there have been increasing efforts to develop training and staff development programs uh, that really do focus explicitly on these. So we have more of a base to work from than we did five years ago. The third element around um, uh, quality rating and improvement is planning, monitoring, and accountability systems. And I think that the more that those programs really are inclusive and reach out to uh, ensure that there are diverse perspectives offering information, advice, and participating in the process, uh, the more that uh, issues of race, language, and culture will be addressed. And there, there are some states like Washington State and I think Arizona as well, which have really taken time in their planning and development of quality rating and improvement systems and in their monitoring of them to make sure that they've engaged stakeholders who really are expert on the different races, language, and cultures in the that exist within their states. Uh, the fourth around financial support for programs, practitioners, and families is, uh, and I think that this is also now reflected in the Race to the Top applications, that if we're really going to make QRAS to be a lever for closing current disparities and outcomes uh, that are experienced by children and families, and particularly children and families of color or from different language backgrounds, uh, QRS will have to contribute to making high quality care more available to low income populations. And simply establishing a rating system that improves um, care overall does not necessarily mean that it, it improves care uh, for those children and families who are in uh, low-income neighborhoods or in uh, neighborhoods which are culturally and linguistically um, require uh, different responses. And so in order to um, really ensure that QRAS is a lever for reform, it does require workforce development which offers opportunities for advancement and careers from those from uh, all different uh, cultural, linguistic, racial backgrounds. And so the financial support is not simply financial support uh, to improve the quality of overall care, but it's really to improve the quality of care with particular attention to ensuring that we are doing so in ways that reach um, diverse populations. And finally, engagement, outreach, and promotion. Uh, I think that the, and the, the background paper certainly provides us that uh, a lot of references that uh, engaging families and recognizing their own expertise is key to developing early care and education systems. And particularly when you get at the 
uh, at the grassroots level, authentic engagement and leadership, uh, which involves sharing of power and decision making, really does um, produce uh, uh, overall commitment to quality improvement and toward developing culturally, uh, not only culturally competent and relevant care, but also higher quality care generally. And we know how to do this in many respects, but it takes time and two-way communications to do so successfully that particularly when one gets to the ground level and working within communities, with programs, and with, com and with families, uh, the time and two-way communication where one values the families and their expertise and engagement and reaches out to them is one way of helping to ensure very much that um, uh, issues of race, language, and culture will be successfully addressed and there will be strong bridges between the culture that may exist in the larger society and the culture that exists in the community. So um, the, the next question that we're asking of you all is going to come up and we'd also like to get at this point any questions you have of me before I turn it over to, um, to Eva to talk about um, uh, part three of our presentation around uh, uh, how we can take practical steps. So um, this question is really, uh, have you and your state recognized that there are differences in culture and particularly around issues around uh, individual versus uh, collective, uh, um, uh, collective identity around uh, time, around uh, uh, competition versus collaboration in your QRIS. Have, have you uh, begun to recognize these or try to develop these? And the, the answers are no, not yet. Uh, generally, by emphasizing that we do want to create culturally competent uh, QRISs in, in introductions of patterns. Uh, three, in training for workers. Uh, four is we've really felt that we're embedding these throughout our system. And five is don't think we need to. So I'll give you a couple minutes to respond to the um, question. And Charlie, you've got a hand raised right now. Marilyn Lawrence. Marilyn, do you have a question? Yeah, and Marilyn, if you hit star seven, you can unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. You can also type in your questions, too. Charlie, you want to talk about the results of the poll? Yeah, I'll, well, as, as you can see from the results that, um, and I think that this is a pretty good reflection of where the, the state of the field is, that um, generally um, there, and this was when we've looked at uh, QRIS is uh, five years ago versus now, we've seen a lot more emphasis in terms of at least generally uh, uh, stating something around cultural competence, but it's also there have been some moves to provide for greater impetus for training for workers specifically on cultural competence and to embedding it within the QRIS system itself. Um, and we also, I think, um, uh, and I now want to turn it over to Eva, but just really saying 
one of the things that um, I find heartening about this is that I think that there are uh, a lot of people who are beginning to address these issues and, uh, and having um, taken the first steps at least uh, to do so, but there are also a lot of people who have, have been moving forward and who we can learn from and learn with in how to do that in training in, uh, in specific measures within the QRAS, in um, the early learning standards, and uh, in our um, professional development programs, and in our monitoring systems. So. Um, I guess now I'd like to turn it over to Eva. Thanks, Charlie. So I just wanted to emphasize again some of the points that Charlie made. I think the first one is that the, the document to which he referred in the, the first couple of sections and uh, what, one of the major reasons for this webinar really was to share with you that this resource that we've developed and that we will continue to develop. It is a living document in that we are going to continue to add new evidence as evidence gets created and collected and, and answered. Um, but you know, there is this tension sometimes in our field, this tension between waiting for more and more and more evidence kind of with some conclusive, conclusive answers versus moving forward on the evidence that we do have. And I think our, our point today, and the, uh, the point that Char I hear Charlie make all the time, is really um, it is so important that we need to move forward now with the, with the evidence that we do have. And so this next section, I, I will be talking about some, just some general thoughts we have about moving forward. And then I will give you a specific example of a project uh, that, that Bill did, a, a, when was it, last year, 2012, uh, it was funded by the Kellogg Project. And I'll give you some more concrete examples about how we can move this agenda forward. So, so in regards to just some general thoughts about putting this type of knowledge into practice, um, one of the things that we can all consider in our work is the roles we have for our early childhood leaders. Uh, are they spokespeople? Are they door openers? Are they both? And we would argue that awareness is always a precursor to change. Uh, always, always, always. Education on the evidence that is contained in this document is going to be key uh, because if you are a leader, if you are the type of stakeholder who is often a spokesperson for this, for this topic around uh, culturally, linguistic, ability, diverse, early childhood settings, uh, then it is good to have this evidence at the tip of your fingers. It is good to, to have a couple of sound bites. It is good to have resources to send to people. It is good to have a document where you can um, use some of the evidence that we've cited in your own reports and in your own applications. So, so definitely awareness is essential. Uh, again, also, it is always better to be proactive than reactive. So advocates, who are really championing this topic, um, we don't have to wait to be asked about, oh, what do you think about cultural competence and what do you think, um, you know, we really are the ones to promote this. Um, you know, I think this topic in particular, uh, you know, we all know it, it is a sensitive, difficult topic. I think many of us in this field, of course, are well-meaning and well-intentioned and we want all children to benefit from all of the systems work that we're doing, um, but it still does require an eye to really examine and, and unpack uh, whose, whose perspective, whose framework, whose cultural models are really represented in the work that we're doing. Uh, so the people who we're, we're training and talking to, those of you on the phone right now, can be advocates and start to promote this agenda. And again, documents like this will give you some ammunition for doing that. And, and lastly, yes, it is better to blunder forward than wait behind. And as you move forward on this agenda, you will discover that there are people that have expertise in the, ability, in the areas of race, culture, ability, and, and language who can provide you with even more resources, who can provide you with examples of where it's going well and which programs are doing it well. Um, so it, it's amazing. As you step into this work, pe people do come to, to rally with you. 
Uh, another general thought about putting knowledge into practice is one way we can do this is to develop learning communities that can produce change. And I think many of us are now increasingly familiar with this idea of, of a learning community or a practice community. Uh, we would argue to, that it would be really important to include families in this effort. Uh, families are experts on their cultures. Um, you know, as professionals or experts in their fields, we really need both. We really need both to move this work forward. It's not an either or. And when we have inclusive processes, what we do is we create ownership. We have inclusive solutions that are not one-sided or, or, or narrowly prescribed. And in terms of the planning that we do and our decision-making process, <laughs> I think this is a really hard one, is to take a look at the, at the room, take a look at who's sitting around the table, and to think very carefully, where is there room uh, for, for more inclusion? Where is there room to include voices? And how do we include voices? Um, you know, maybe it's not always appropriate to, to, to invite families to, to come to these big stakeholder meetings. Maybe there are other ways we can consider structuring our decision making. And finally, just for a, another general thought, um, is, is in thinking about our leadership and in thinking about the experts who are moving systems building forward uh, in, the, in the early childhood field, um, another, another big idea that we have here is to promote and recognize the development of people of color as experts and leaders. And so, so, so not only families, but even those, those budding researchers, those, those budding professionals who have a, a good mind for systems building, um, who, can, who really bring their own authentic perspective to the work. But in addition to that, I think often uh, the people who are most drawn to, to this agenda are people of color, people from marginalized communities. And to think about ways that we can promote their leadership and, and promote their expertise and, and give them more of a voice to speak as we continue to, to um, make big decisions about our system. So moving on from some of these general ideas about putting knowledge into action, uh, what I'd like to share with you is I think a really important technical assistant project project that Bill offered states back in 2012. And a lot of times when we, when we talk about this topic, um, what, what we hear from stakeholders a lot is, okay, yeah, we get it. We know this is important. We believe you. We believe the evidence that exists. Tell us how to do this work. That, you know, um, state administrators and, and the people who are implementing programs and policies, they are hungry for ideas and assistance and how to take concrete steps. So BUILD was able to get some funding from the Kellogg Foundation, and uh, they developed a project called the, the, the Quality Rating and Improvement System Diversity and Equity TA Project. And the three big objectives of this project were, one, to promote greater awareness and understanding among state leaders about how their own state's decisions might have an impact on social inequities and how those leaders can start to change the structure to address those inequities. So that was the first objective, you know, pretty big, lofty objective. Um, the second objective was really uh, to expand the knowledge base about how we incorporate issues of, of racial, cultural, linguistic, and ability responsiveness into our systems building. How do we create broader recognition of these issues within the overall field? And then the third objective was to foster the capacity of additional champions and experts to uh, provide assistance to others in developing quality rating and improvement systems using a social equity lens. So uh, in order to accomplish those big objectives, BUILD created three distinct yet related approaches for offering technical assistance. Um, and so a, a request for proposal was released, and 33 states and three territories all submitted applications. These were competitive applications um, to receive this type of TA. And I have to say, um, I remember um, you know, kind of talking with Jerry Cobb about this work, and we were both so excited about the response that we saw from all of these states and territories in this issue, and it, and it just was so encouraging to see that people were really 
um, ready to move forward. So the three types of technical assistance that were awarded, um, the first type was a train the trainer program around race and language. And it was a two day workshop. It was held in Philadelphia. And each of the 15 states sent two representatives. And uh, the people who attended um, learned a specific curriculum that they could take back to their states and, and use to train other trainers. Uh, this, the, the second type of technical assistance was a learning table. And the learning table was facilitated and hosted by Camille Catlett at Fred Porter Graham. It was a six-part monthly webinar series. And if I'm remembering correctly, each state had a team of approximately six to eight people, uh, mostly leaders and, and early childhood stakeholders. Uh, there were a couple of states who really kind of um, thought outside of the box and, and invited new participants, new voices to, to their teams. And the, the format of the, the learning table, the format, the resources, the homework the teams had, the content, really encouraged these teams to consider how their, con their connections and their, their, their infrastructure um, you know, really encouraged them to plan how to make their, their early childhood system more responsive to communities and families. And then the third TA that was offered, uh, we called it Customized Technical Assistance. And there were seven states who participated in this. And I have to say that some of the states had there, there were several states that had both learning table and custom TA. Um, there were also some states that had both learning table and train the trainer. So there was some overlap. There were some state teams who were able to benefit from, from multiple types of technical assistance. And for the customized TA, it really is exactly what it, what, it, what it sounds like. Each state team was assigned their own technical assistance provider, and they worked closely with this um, consultant to accomplish some goals and objectives that were developed by the team. And um, you know, each state's team's goals were distinct from other states, but, but what they all had in common was wanting to work towards improving racial, cultural, and linguistic responsiveness in their systems, in their systems building. So this was a, a big project. There were many components. Uh, the evaluation was, was um, I think, pretty big as well. It was mostly a process evaluation simply because this work was so open-ended and every state team was, was different and the TA they received was different. Uh, so the evaluation was mostly descriptive, but we did use several different modalities for collecting data. Uh, we used online surveys for the, to get feedback on the Train the Trainer workshop series. We used online surveys uh, for after each learning table segment. And then we also used interviews uh, after the whole entire learning table sequence ended and also after the customized TA was finished. So we had a lot of really, really rich data. And I am going to just distill some of that data. Um, what I thought would be important to share with you were some really concrete examples of what they actually did for this project. So the most common things that, that we saw happening, there were, there were many different layers of, of work that were going on, but I think the most common, what we really saw, were that state teams, they convened large groups of stakeholders in their respective states for buy-in. They did things like you know, they met several times over the year. They developed common definitions for this work. They developed guiding principles. And you can imagine if you've done this type of work before, the hours and hours of conversation that it takes to reach consensus on this. And given this, the context of what we were talking about, it was important that they had very skilled facilitators working with them to talk about issues that are not always easy to talk about. Uh, so they developed guiding principles, a common vision, and I think most importantly, an agreement to start integrating this work throughout different layers of the early childhood system. Uh, something, another, another big task that, that many of the state teams took on was that they took a look at their quality rating and improvement system. They looked at the, their manual, the framework, the competencies, standards, and indicators, and they really teased those things apart. They added and integrated equity and diversity pr principles throughout. So that was really big work. And as you can imagine, a year simply was not long enough um, when the project ended States were still continuing to work on these goals. But um, yeah, every, every state that participated made, made movement forward. And to, to summarize what we found, I think to, to make some, some points here that are useful for what we're discussing today, is one of our biggest findings was, was that 
integrated technical assistance approaches were much more successful. So for those state teams that had both attended the learning table and also had their very own uh, consultant to do some hand-holding with them and to really walk them through the process, we saw that they made a lot more progress on their goals and objectives. Um, what we also noticed and I don't know if this will make sense to you, I think, I think it will, but the developmental stage of a state's quality rating and improvement system, uh, you, know, you know, were they at the very beginning of building their QRIS or were they further along into it? So, so the, the, development, the developmental stage and also the political context in the state, uh, and maybe not even broad political context, maybe just even within the early childhood community, uh, the political context for embracing equity and diversity pr principles were often predictors of how much progress a state was able to make during the course of this project. So, um, so those are some contextual factors that were really important to, to consider, at least for this particular type of TA. Um, we also found that most of the states who participated in this project, they started with, I want to say just the narrow objective, even though I, I don't mean to suggest it's a small task, but um, it was a narrow objective of, of re revising the standard. But as they continued to work uh, with their learning table team and with their individual diversity consultants, they quickly discovered that they needed to focus on other aspects of their system, uh, especially when it came to aligning the standards in their QRIS and taking a look at their professional development infrastructure. They, and I remember a quote from, from one, of the, one of the interview informants, and she said, you know, this work doesn't fit into a nice, neat little box. Once you start working on this, you quickly discover how it ripples out to the rest of the system. And so that if we're going to revise our standards and our indicators and our QRIS, then we absolutely need to take our, a look at our professional development system and think about the implications for our trainers and our technical assistance providers, like our coaches and consultants. Um, so, so that awareness of really how wide and far-reaching this work is very quickly dawned on, on many, many of the states who, um, who were working on their QRIS indicators. Oh, and, and finally, what we realized kind of at the end was that there were a handful of states that were starting to feel that they were ready for their next phase of diversity consultation. And so what that meant was they, they had broad buy-in from stakeholders. They developed common definitions and a new common vision. Uh, they've taken a look at their indicators. Now they're ready to, to really work on that next level, which is, okay, let's take a look at our workforce competencies. In particular, they were focused on the trainers and their technical assistance practitioners, like coaches and consultants. Uh, there were some states who were even really hungry for tools and measures so that child care administrators could start to even do their own self-assessments. Uh, so we're starting to see the evolution of, of just a handful, just a handful, not many, because as we saw even earlier in this webinar today, I think the majority of states are still at the very, very beginning of this work. Um, but it was exciting to see that among the states who received this technical assistance from this project, there were some that were really um, making some advances that was exciting. In terms of the challenges and barriers to, to getting this done work maybe more efficiently or just more of this work, um, what we commonly heard uh, was the perception that there was not enough time, there were too many other competing priorities that were going on. Um, you know, this, so many of us are familiar with this feeling of being stretched way too thin. You know, we, we take on so many roles uh, you know, so many different responsibilities in our roles. And uh, what I heard from several different interview informants is they said, oh, I wish I could only work on this issue full time. I wish I didn't have all these other things pulling me in different directions. So there was this tendency to see this, this work on diversity and equity as an add-on to what they're doing as opposed to being central to achieving the mission, right? The mission being all children or is um, Camille Catlett says, and I and borrowed this phrase, seeing each and every child, each and every child being ready to succeed in school. 
And so I think that is part of where this, this uh, document that, that Charlie told you about today can, can really help us even shift our frames for how we see this work. Um, I don't remember what, what slide it was, Charlie, that you had, but it, you said, you know, um, you know, this work, quality, this is central to our work on quality. When we offer culturally and linguistically responsive care, it is quality care. And so it kind of begs the question, can we truly have quality care without attending to these issues? So these are some of the discussions that, that we will, I'm sure, continue to have, and hopefully you will continue to have those in your states and in your teams. And um, a concluding thought to again share with you is that even though we are, there's still so many questions that have yet to be answered and our, our research agendas are still so full of things that we'd like to study and, and really uh, obtain more evidence, we know right now we do know enough to act. And um, we do have a lot of work to do, so we, we, we better get started. And this is kind of a nice way of saying, you know, there are lots and lots of valid excuses that many of us hear and also use ourselves about why we're not pushing this agenda more. Um, so our hope with this webinar today and with sharing this document with you is that these kinds of conversations can provide some meaningful direction and contribute to this own agenda in your own state. So I'd like to end my portion by um, I think maybe first asking if there are any questions about what we've shared today. I don't see any questions typed on the left column, and I don't see any hands raised. Um, so, so maybe we will go to answering the, the next poll question. But certainly do not hesitate to, to contact me or Charlie, even if you think of questions after this webinar. And I also uh, want to express again uh, that an email will be sent out in a couple of days. It will have a link to a, 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 web, a web page hosted by BUILD. And on that web page you will see PDFs. Um, you will see this document that we've been talking about. Uh, there's a link to the Frank Porter Graham site that has all those wonderful resources that were available to the state learning teams. There's so many resources there. I really encourage you to take some time to go and, and look through what, what Camille Catlett has put together there. Um, so, so again, you'll be receiving a link with some more information. Uh, but but uh, yeah, I see that people are responding. Do you want to be a part of a learning community? Okay. Charlie, is there anything that you want to share about this particular question and how we might follow up on this? Well, I'm glad that there are a few people at least who want to meet new friends because I think <laughs> one of the things that Eva mentioned in her work with the Kellogg Foundation was that um, a lot of people just really enjoyed the opportunity as part of a learning community to connect with other people who are doing similar things. And there's a lot to learn from one another, but it's also just nice to know that other people are um, working on the same issues and uh, have the same, uh, same values and same desires to do things. So. Yeah, I, I agree. But you know, I also think that what we suffer from in our field, in our early childhood field in particular, is that there are lots of individual or patchwork efforts going on in our states and communities. And I think the, the biggest and most impactful change is really when we do this work in, a, in conjunction with our systems building. And I, I, I'm sure that many of the people on the call today are a part of a build state, so I don't know if it's part of your build agenda, but even if you are not a build state, uh, to really think about how this work can be integrated in other systems building efforts. I, I'm sure that so many states now have a, some type of a professional development work group. Um, there, there are people who have committees meeting for their quality rating and improvement systems. Whatever it looks like in your state, I, I, my, I think my biggest recommendation is to do this work in conjunction with the, with the enormous infrastructure work that we now see happening. Thanks. Thanks, Eva. And, and we do have a few questions that have come in, I think focused on, on the project that Eva was talking about. One of the, one of the questions is, um, are there trainers that can come to preschools and give a workshop to students? 
Of course, for free, if they asked. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think this is part of the infrastructure building that both Charlie and I addressed in our portions. And if we are wanting our child care workforce to be able to work with children in a way that really promotes their healthy development, uh, we absolutely need to pay attention to whether we have the capacity in our communities and whether we have trainers and technical assistance providers who can deliver this training. And so, uh, so Irene, I, I'm not sure where you are located, what city you are in, um, but my guess, I don't, I don't know, I, I, I think it really just kind of depends on where you're located about whether or not there are trainers who can come to your staff and train your staff. Um, and then someone wanted to know just... I think, well, I, I'd also like to answer that, that yeah, I think that states increasingly as they develop quality rating and improvement systems are, are incorporating things around uh, what they'd like to see in the way of training opportunities available to staff, and often those are made available through child care resource and referral networks or mm -hmm. other... Um, yeah. Other um, resources in the community and uh, without without cost um, that there have been developed in some places uh, specific training training modules around how can I be culturally responsive, how can I engage mm -hmm. families from mm -hmm. different backgrounds and cultures uh, in this work and. Um, there may not be a specific training or a workshop in your area that provides this, but I'd certainly check with CCR and ours. There's also, you know, an opportunity to say we'd really like to have training in this area from mm -hmm. some of these resources. Right. And I think that there are developing over time, and that's one of our responsibilities as far as I think a learning community is, even if they're not specific training, at least training materials and resources that have been developed that have worked uh, in one community, uh, if we can make sure that they're more available to other communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Charlie. Um, any other questions that folks have for our, uh, our presenters today? Feel free to type them in. Okay. And we have gotten several questions just around um, whether the PowerPoints will be available and, and the, the materials will be available. Um, tomorrow morning an email will go out to everyone who registered for the webinar. It will include um, the PowerPoint as well as the documents um, and some of the other things that um, um, Eva talked about. There also will be a link to a survey. Um, that survey will provide you an opportunity to um, share other resources that you think the field should be aware of around this topic. Um, as well as, um, I think, uh, offer you an opportunity to kind of reiterate your interest in a learning community around this work. Um, so that will be available and sent out to you tomorrow. Um, oh, we have another question. Um, it says, how do you ensure any decision that the community members are making are the best decisions for children? <laughs> <laughs> That's the million dollar question. million dollar question. <laughs> wow. Right, 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 right. Well, I think that was um, there. There was a, a slide a little bit earlier about that I had about leadership and how it's really important that if we do invite families and community members to to participate in these conversations and decision making, that at the same time we also have our experts in, in in our field to. You know, so, so so it's a discussion that is informed by, by the authentic lived um, experiences of people in the community, um, but also kind of integrated with what we know about child development and, and, and a healthy development for all children. Yeah, I'd like to just add on. I think Eva said it uh, exactly right. That there, I mean, we know about child development, and we have. Uh, ways of uh, supporting child development that, uh, the, that that have been developed that are that are pretty universal. We have experts on child development uh, who can be supportive. But I think we have to, at the community level, if we have a system where there really is an opportunity for di dialogue and discussion uh, with people in the community, parents and and 
community members around what they want for their kids and the expertise on how you can do that. That really at the ground level um, is, you know, I have a lot of confidence in people. I mean, parents love their kids and want them to succeed. And uh, people who are in the early childhood profession uh, want to provide developmentally high quality care to their kids and, uh, and further, in most instances, provide support to their families so that their families can also contribute. So it's uh, creating that space and opportunity for people to get together. Um, and at the community level, it's often easier to do that without, um, and it's n never necessarily easy, but it's not easier to do that in kind of a, an asset-based way where you're not trying to look at somebody doing something wrong, but you're trying to look at how can we make this best for our kids. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think that the, I mean I, I think that there are different resources that are have been developed from from Head Start, from uh, the Strengthening Families Network, and from other work around family engagement that really do point to ways of creating this this space for uh, good discussions at the community and neighborhood level that can really lead to to a better understanding, really to blend that expertise about the family with the expertise around the, uh, from the child development community. All right, well, I want to thank our presenters and all of the webinar participants for your questions and, and your input. And, and I think I speak on behalf of all of us where we, we look forward to where this discussion is going to go. And um, we appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by.